Hey, and then this week in pharmacy, this is a special episode for me. It brings things full circle in many ways um, from our perspective at Pharmacy Podcast Network. How many layers that we've had over 15 years? It'll be 15 years in, in March of 2024. Um, and one of the special interviews that I did was in November of 2018. And the title of the podcast episode was Pharmacist and Healthcare Disruptor, Martin Van uh, Tristine, Tristine of Civica. And it was, it was a, it was a, an eye opener because of knowing that not only a pharmacist was driving this and doing this, but what Civica stood for and what it's become over the years has been significant. And it's shown that you can drive value in medication management without having to um, bankrupt your um, your patients and the people that you're supposed to be uh, caring for. Uh, Martin, I am so excited to have you back. Welcome to This Week in Pharmacy. Well, Todd, thank you for inviting me and congratulations on your such a long run doing a podcast, 15 years. That's amazing. You were must have been one of the first people to do podcasts that were related to medications and drugs. Yeah, we were the first. Uh, we were the first professional-based podcast about the the pharmacy industry, and it's um it's a I take a lot of pride in it as as you do in what you did in growing uh, Civica, and you we and I both uh, uh, share um, the love of something that you really helped to create, launch, and now see um, driving. I have I have a lot more work to do. I'm uh, not at the stage where I'm ready to. To, to you know go to the next stage of my life and in this case retirement for you but um I'm gonna I'm gonna want to share your story right now with our listeners who have known about you they've read about you in in you know news articles they've heard you speak on on YouTube and um, other podcasts but um tell us uh 2018 to 2023 um tell us a little bit about the success of Civic RX. I think I think it starts even before 2018, right? So clearly, um, I'm a far, I'm educated as a pharmacist. You know, I immediately uh, left pharmacy school and graduated and went to work in the industry. But in pharmacy school, I d developed a strong sense of doing what's in the best interest of the patient. And as I did my whole pharmacy pharmaceutical career, that's always been in the back of my mind. As I was in R and D or manufacturing, or the head of quality at Amgen, or eventually becoming the CEO and the founder of Civica. It's always been in my back of my mind, do what's in the best interest of the patients. And when I retired from Amgen in 2016, you know, I had the opportunity to really step back and think to myself, what do I want to do in retirement? And clearly it was, it was funny in a way. So when I told my wife I was going to retire from Amgen, she was scared to death, right? She was really worried that I would be like a puppy dog following her around all day. And, you know, we, we developed a very nice balance of, of me staying out of her way and playing golf and working on cars and doing different things and her going shopping and being with her friends. And then in 2017, about a gentleman by the name of Dan Deliquist came forward with this idea that he wanted to start a nonprofit pharmaceutical company. And he was going to have a meeting in Salt Lake City with all kinds of experts to try to figure out if this was a good idea. Mm. So he had a lot of people from health systems and hospitals. He had some politicians, economists. Uh, some pharmacists and some people from industry and some lawyers. And we were in this room and we were listening to his ideas for, for a good part of a day. And at the end of the meeting, I went up to Dan and I said, you know, Dan, I think you got a good idea, but I think you're focusing in the wrong space. You know, going after drug pricing is a, is a noble endeavor, but you're not going to have an impact going after drug pricing by starting a nonprofit company since all of those drugs that are really expensive that are under patent they're on patent right and you're not going to affect that but there's this other big problem out there called drug shortages mm -hmm. and i think this is the perfect fit for a nonprofit company 
So with that comment I made, you know, half heartedly at the end of a meeting led me to be asked to start the company, to found it, to hire the staff and do all those things. And it was interesting because Dan would call me and I would tell, no, I'm not the right guy. It's not, that's not my expertise, right? On manufacturing quality and quality guy. I'm not a, a sales and marketing guy. I'm not a CEO. I'm not a finance guy. And we went back and forth on the phone for many, many weeks where I would say no. And he would ask again. And I would say no. And he'd ask again. And finally, my wife is also uh, a pharmacist by education and practice you know, said to me one day, you know, Martin, you really should do this. You're passionate about giving back to patients. You're passionate about the failure of the industry, creating drug shortages. This is your opportunity to give back. I think you should do it. So the next time Dan called, I said, yes. Hmm. Now, when I said yes, my wife got scared to death again. And I was going back to work. <laughs> I was going to work, you know, many hours a week and, and, and ignore her. So, so everything goes around in a circle. So once I said yes, the first first order of business was to hire a team, right? I mean, I couldn't do this on myself. I needed a team. And I didn't want to hire a team of healthcare professionals. I wanted a pharmaceutical team with some healthcare professionals mm -hmm. uh, and to develop the business model and to make sure that we could solve drug shortages. And so the unique thing about Civica is we're a cooperative right? We're a member-driven organization and all members are treated completely equally, same price, same access to drugs, no special treatment for the largest health systems in the world over the smallest hospitals that we deal with. So we're a cooperative, which is a really interesting dilemma or di not, di not dilemma, but interaction. Mm -hmm. So people who are customers are our owners, right? So it creates a very symbiotic relationship where they want us to succeed, mm -hmm. right? Because they're our members, but they also own us. So if we fail, not only do they don't get drugs or own drug shortages, they lose the money they put forward to set up the company. Yep. And as a nonprofit, clearly we don't have investors and we don't have shareholders. So we're not worried about the bottom line in the sense of, oh, the quarter's come and due. I need to show good results to Wall Street so my stock price goes up, or I have a payment due to an investor and I have to pay them interest rates. I don't I never had that pressure on me. So that gave us freedom to do things that a for-profit company couldn't do. And so from that business model, we then had to go and ask our members, what were the most important drugs you need right now? Because we can't we can't bring 200 drugs to, to the market overnight. We got to prioritize. And the first drug that they came forward and said was vancomycin. And so we went on a search to find a supplier of vancomycin so that we could make sure we provided vancomycin to our members. And the way we did it was to create, try to create a win-win financial structure. So we the, re, the way generic drug companies don't think of us as competition. They think of us as a partner, is that we give them a contract that they see it as a win. So today, if they make a batch of product and they ship it to us, as soon as it's released by quality, we write them a check and pay them. They don't have to worry about GPOs and wholesalers and tracking their drugs and compliance to contracts or anything like that. They make it, we pay them. On the other hand, when they go through the system, the current system with GPOs and wholesalers, they don't get paid for that whole lot or that whole batch until they sell the whole batch. They get paid as it's sold. So that they, have, they like what we do, right? Write them a check. They don't have to worry about it. And then I worry about compliance and all those other things. So they like that from a perspective of the supplier. And then I guarantee them a contract, five years guaranteed price. So it takes all the uncertainty out of what they're doing. They know how much I need for the next five years. They can buy the raw materials. They should never be short on a raw material. They don't have to worry about capacity on the line. So if they need to upgrade a line, they know they know what they have to do. They have a five-year contract. On the other hand, we go to hospitals and we offer them guaranteed. 
This is the guaranteed price for five years. And we guarantee that you're always going to have inventory because we're going to keep six months of that inventory dedicated to you in our warehouses. Mm -hmm. So if there is a disruption in the supply chain, I can cover you because I got six months of inventory with your name on it. And so it's kind of that win-win on both sides of the equation. And now with the, once we've started proving our value in the marketplace and to our members, you know, the, we've been talking to the government about how do you solve drug shortages? Mm -hmm. we're talking to BARDA. And they were always asking us, what would it take to build a plant? What would it take to be have a plant at the ready in a crisis? And we went through those negotiations and we gave them a number. And, you know, dealing with a government agency is not something you expect to happen lightning fast. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things I'd go to Washington, I have lunch with them and I sit down and go through our plans, what we were going to do. And then COVID came. And mm -hmm. it was like COVID came, a check came the next day. And it really accelerated that <clears throat> process. Now we were always going to build a plant. This is going to take us longer to do because we needed to raise the money. But when the government stepped in, then we started building the plant. And it should open next year, selling product for sale. We've made our submit, uh, Civic has made their submission to the, F, to the FDA for their first product. So in a matter of 10 months, they should have approval for that. That's incredible. That's incredible. What has Civic, uh, I've been wanting to ask this question of you, uh, although it's interesting now, um, that it's been since 2018 that we've that we've had you on. But what what does what has Civica taught the pharmaceutical industry? You know, it's interesting because everybody says to me, "Do these people see you as a threat? This competition?" And some players in the marketplace are afraid of us, and they think we're a threat to them. And others see us as a solution right? A solution to their problems that they're being blamed for, that we're stepping up and solving the problem. So they can then say, well, we like Civic and we want them to succeed. We want to help them. And others will say, we want to compete with them. But if you look around, you start hearing things like GPOs are mandating that companies keep six months of inventory, three months of inventory. Well, that happened because Civic approved it worked, right? Um, so you're starting to see things change in the marketplace. You, the government is starting to catch on to their business model. And it's very interesting if you go back in time and you look at Senator Elizabeth Warren, she had put together a proposal for the government to make drugs. And if you look at her proposal in detail, it's very similar to the Civic business model. Hmm. Now, she reintroduced that idea in the most recent Senate Finance Committee meeting on drug shortages and solutions on drug shortages, where Civica had Alan Coco representing Civica testifying in front of that committee. Unbelievable. That's incredible. What I'm thinking is how this can teach um, individual groups of pharmacies and even our independent community pharmacies to be able to rely on a on a delivery to their to their patients and and use those civic alike um, business mechanisms and strategies to make sure that that's happening. I think of our buying groups that have you know two, three, and you know even even four thousand members and how powerful that is if if they were able to internalize uh, a Civica model to assure that their um, patients aren't running out of uh, critical medications. So I've not had the, the time to really study the retail pharmacy market and the intercies and how it works behind the scenes. But I do have some, you know, I have done some research. And, you know, what we're seeing is the profit in the pharmaceutical supply chain is being sucked up the ladder, I call it. Mm -hmm. So you had the pharma companies, they were the kings, they made all the money. Well, then you had PBMs enter the marketplace and then wholesalers. 
then insurance companies, the payers, and the pharmacist and the pharmacy are somewhere in between those three. And as I describe it is those intermediaries between the manufacturer, the pharmacy, and the payer and the patient or the consumer have created a very efficient highway from the manufacturer to the patient, which is which was necessary, which was good. But now they've realized how efficient their highway is. And now they've become highway men. Yeah. Sticking every piece, you know, taking a piece out of every every transaction through the system. And it really, really hurts mm -hmm. the community for independent pharmacists. Right? Absolutely. The big chains are part of that, you know, that I call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse of generic drugs, you know. Um, and I have personal examples where it's just bizarre where you no normal human being can understand what's going on. So as an older gentleman, I clearly have to take medication, so a statin for cholesterol. I take hypertensive medications. And I remember going to my Walgreens with a prescription for a statin. And I go to the, the, the pharmacy counter, I give them the prescription, and then I go to pick up my medication and for a 90 day supply of a statin, they wanted $240, a generic statin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, 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 this must be wrong because I'm in the business, right? I know how much it costs, I know the system. So I said, can I, can you double check that? That price is wrong. And the technician said, no, it's right. So can I speak to the pharmacist? I'm talking to the pharmacist, they do, he uh, does a little check and he says, no, no, it's 240. So, well, wait a minute. And I go on good RX. And I recommend every pharmacist should recommend to all of their consumers and patients anytime you start complaining, go to good RX. So I go to good RX and the CVS pharmacy, basically across the parking lot from where I'm at, wants to charge me $24. So $24, $240. So I'm now talking to the pharmacist and say, hey, buddy, I'm here. I don't want to pull on my prescriptions. Can you, can you, what can you do? He goes, I can't do anything, Martin. It's $240. Right. I go, come on, I'll give you $50. You know? No, I can't do it. I'll give you $60. No, I said, well, I'm going to go across the street. They're going to call you for my prescription. I want you to give them to them right away or I'm coming back. You know? And I get it for $24 across the street. Now, there's no transparency in the system that says how that happened. Right. I guarantee you CVS does not negotiate any better than Walgreens that they can get a price that's that much cheaper, right? Someone's making excessive profit in the in that supply chain. And, and that's the part we need more transparency in the testimony in front of the Senate Finance Committee. That was a big piece of it. How do we bring more transparency in? How do we let the consumer know what's going on? Because information is power. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then there's, you know, other disruptors like, um, like the cost plus models. Um, there's a Dr. Kyle McCormick who came up with a, a business model uh, during a, a business competition plan at his uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. When he was a, a pharmacy student, he came, was thinking about out of the box models. And, and one of the ideas was what if we started going back in time and charging cash for prescriptions and teaching, teaching the consumer, you don't use insurance for everything. You, if you, if you get in a car accident, you have insurance to cover major, you know, d con, you know, major damage to your car. Um, but you don't, you don't get to use your car insurance for your oil changes. That's just maintenance. So if if you we educated patients and Kyle's built a now um, strong business that's now trickling throughout the the country. I think there's right around twenty cash based pharmacies throughout the country. Very small, but then up pops Mark uh, Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drugs, which was just a uh, a repeat of other models that were taking place. But there's something happening. And now, of course, the cracks in the armor of the three major PBMs 
which now the government is smelling that there was um, trillions, uh, billions of dollars in in play over a 10-year, 20-year period. So we know what the invention of PBMs were, was for in the 80s, and I've studied that through macroeconomics and how PBMs really helped groups of um, groups of people, large networks, large unions that would get involved to drive down drug costs and, and keep things in check for the end family. And then it it snowballed and metamorphosized into a profit cash engine for the PBM that had nothing to do with healthcare. And it was just sucked up into profit. So I see the fusion, Martin, of different models coming together. And I fully expect with the acceleration of value-based care and, and starting to pull away from the prescription fee being the only way to make money in pharmacy. I see a lot of things that are gonna reference the Civica business blueprint to pull some of that in to be able to scale, including hospital systems starting to take control of their own pharmaceutical spend internally. Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, just a couple points on your on your comments, right? One, the people who started Cost Plus Pharmacy, Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Pharmacy, Alex Chesky is one of them. Uh, he 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 came to Civica and learned what we were doing. We we opened our books. I mean, we're we're a very open organization. We think more people who do what we're doing, it's all going to be good and better. So we taught a lot. We shared a lot of stuff with Alex, and he took that into. Mark Cuban's cost plus pharmacy, and we cheer him on, right? We want him to be successful. Then you then you think about, you know, going to cash would be a good thing. And the reason is I can go to get a prescription and the my co pays $20, but if I want to pay cash, it's nine, right? I do better at nine dollars and twenty. And the whole the whole charade that says, well, it's not going to go against your deductible. Well. $20 against my deductible is not going to make me, you know, it's not going to get me anything, right? Yep. right? I'd rather have that $11 in my pocket. And then the whole perversion of the, of the rebate system, you know, it all started with EpiPens. That's where the game changed. So as EpiPens were coming to their patent expiration date, they wanted to figure out a way to keep making money on EpiPens. So Mylan at that point developed a pricing scheme that says, look, you're paying $100 today for two EpiPens. I'm going to raise the price to $300, but I'm going to give you, Mr. PBM, a $200 rebate. So I'm making the same money I used to make, and now you're getting $200 more a prescription than you were before. So now the generic comes to the market, and he says, I want to sell for $20. And the PBM says, no, not unless you give me a $200 rebate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a generic company goes, $200 rebate? I'm only selling it for $20, right? And that just opened the door this whole perverted rebate game where brand manufacturers are giving such a large rebate to PBMs that's more than the generic drug cost, but the PBMs don't want to lose that revenue. So the, the generic drug doesn't get high on the formulary and they push the high price drug and you don't pay for it out of your pocket as a consumer. So, you know, you don't care, right? It goes back to the payer, the union, the company's plan or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, it affects your, affects your insurance rates, right? It affects the money comes out of some pocket that you're in control. So the whole system has to be changed and going back to a very simple, the drug costs this, I'm asking why, is a very good way to do it. Then you take, then you take your receipt from the pharmacy and submit it to the insurance company if you want. Yep. Yep. And I fully, so I fully that's, endorse that. That's the way it used to be too. You used to have to keep your receipts and mail yep. them in, and uh, then the automation started giving way too much data to parties that were using that data in order to predict uh, the type of revenue they could be generating and profit they could be generating, and. Uh, Data can be used for uh, for the good of the people, and it can be used for the profit of individuals. So, <laughs> uh, data, data, the person who has the data has all the power. 
Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's true in any endeavor in life. What's next for you? You keep saying, uh, you're telling me the, this is your second time, uh, going into retirement. So what are you, what are you, what are you passionate about? I know you're going to be spending some time, um, with your wife, which is, this is awesome. That's one of my favorite things to do, not with your wife, with mine, but. Uh, <laughs> well, so my wife and I, we had our 40th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Uh, this year, um, we both graduated pharmacy school in 1983 from, from different universities. And we met on an internship at Abbott Laboratories. And, you know, because of that luck of being on that internship, we had three beautiful daughters, two son-in-laws, a dog, you know. <laughs> and so it was our 40th wedding anniversary. And uh, we were going to go to Hawaii with the entire family. And we go to Hawaii a lot because we lived in California for 12 years. It was an easy trip. So we go, we're going to take the whole family. Uh, right before the trip and anniversary, I had a, like a really bad case of food poisoning. Mm. So I was rushed to the hospital where they did a series of CT scans and they found out I had diverticulitis, not food poisoning, but then they also saw that I had a tumor on my kidney. So it was an incidental find of a tumor on the kidney. And through a series of MRIs and all kinds of other scans, they pretty they felt pretty confident that the tumor was cancer. Mm. And so we needed to schedule a surgery to, to remove the tumor. And so the, the deal was, all right, am I allowed to go to Hawaii for my wedding anniversary with my kids? Or do I need to have the surgery first and then not be able to do anything for 12 weeks? And so the, the the surgeon said, no, it's a slow growing tumor. You know, you can you can go on your, you know, your, your celebration. So I was diagnosed on April 23rd with kidney cancer. Uh, July 11th, I had the tumor removed in about a quarter of my right kidney. And then I went through a series of, of rehab for 12, 12 weeks where I was not allowed to travel. I was not allowed to play golf. I was not allowed to lift more than five pounds. Mm -hmm. So basically I sat in this office here for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I said, what am I going to do? I, this is very unproductive. <laughs> you know, <laughs> feels like, a, feels like I'm in jail, you yeah. know? So uh, I decided to write a book. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a book. It's called Protect, Protecting Patients at All Costs, The Drug Watchdogs. You can get it on Amazon. Um, and it's about a little bit about one, my journey as a pharmacist entering into the pharmaceutical industry. It's a little bit about the army of people out there that are working really hard to keep our supply chain safe, knowing that there's another army every day trying to figure out how to get around all the safeguards we put in place. <laughs> Yeah, uh, to, to introduce substandard counterfeit medicine into the supply chain and the importance for the consumer and the patient to buy from a regulated supply chain. But it's also a roadmap for young professionals who want to start, have a career like I did and gives them a roadmap and the skill and the skills they need to get there. And so it was something that I never thought I would do. And by the way, it was the hardest thing I ever did. Sitting down from scratch and writing a book is extremely hard. Mm. Uh, but I, I wrote it. I achieved it. I'm, I'm proud of the work. I'm not saying it's good. It might just be a book you put by the nightstand because it'll help you go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but I accomplished something in a time where I could have had really bad thoughts and really thought bad things. and and really affected my outcome in a negative way so now that i've written a book i have a i have a desire i have five books i want to write now yeah. so i'm now sitting down writing a suspense thriller not related to the pharmaceutical industry at all more related to spy craft and and, and those kind of things and a, a romance spy craft book so wow. i'm work i'm working on that now and I, I give the I give the, the chapters 
and the summaries to my wife. And I go, is this, when you read those, those kind of books, is this what it sounds like? It yeah. Does? So I'm working on that, but of course I'm now I'm, I'm working on getting back into shape. You know, my muscles have to, you know, deteriorate when you can't do anything and you sit around all day. I'm working about getting in shape, getting my golf game back into form and, now, all this travel that my wife and I haven't had a chance to do because I work a very, very busy corporate executive role for most of my career that required me to travel, that my wife and I get a chance to travel and see the world. It's incredible. Very, very proud of you as a pharmacist that led in a way that is now going to have a lasting and legacy impact on, on our healthcare system. And it's it's the lessons that can be taught by the individual that's passionate enough to take the time to teach those lessons. And you're one of those people, uh, Martin, and it's it's an honor to have interviewed you for the second time in the in the close of this chapter in in your life. And now you get to move on to some fun. So I'll, I'll uh, the, the, one, the, the one thought I'll leave the audience, and I think it's an important thought because in our jobs, we can always get consumed by, you know, the minutia of the job. Yeah. You know, I got to do this task and that task. I got to, you know, lock up here and do this and do that. And we lose focus, right? And to me, our focus is the patient, right? And and we really should go back to remember what our oath was when we were in pharmacy school. And I always sum it up as to do what's in the best interest of the patient. Mm -hmm. And, and serving patients comes with a responsibility, with, is a privilege, and that privilege comes with responsibilities. And depending on where you are in the supply chain, those, 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 those responsibilities differ. But for me, it was always make sure that there are quality of drugs available when the patients or the consumer needed them. Right? And in every place else in the supply chain, that responsibility might be different. But that license that we carry as a pharmacist is given to us by society as a privilege. It's not our right. It's a privilege. And if we think about doing what's in the best interest of patients, those mundane tasks kind of go away. They're not as important. They're not as, they're not as you know, gnawing and, and disturbing to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, for sharing this with us and for, for your work. Um, it's, it wasn't easy and, and you, uh, sacrificed, you know, time and, uh, you, um, you made something very successful and impactful and that's why I was excited to have you back. And I, uh, I can't wait to the, the next book comes out. I'm actually going to start with protecting patients at all costs. Once again, that's protecting patients at all costs, the drug watchdogs, um, uh, available now on, uh, Amazon came out in September and, um, we're going to promote it on social media and, um, and, and through this podcast as well. But Martin, I thank you. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Todd. It was great talking to you. We should catch up more like this more often. It, one, instead of once every, what was it? Seven, eight years. So. Yep. Yep. All right. You take care. All right. Take care, Todd. Bye.